to read a couple of passages of Scripture this morning. First one is Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20, and then we'll go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So let's stand and give honor to the word of the Lord this morning. Great passage. Here is our strength, our hope, um, our protection as we do battle with spiritual warfare every day in our life. Um, the Apostle Paul, with great encouragement to God's people, say, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you will may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. There, stand therefore, having fastened on the breast or the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And now finally to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 where Paul says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as it happened among you, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith. Thank you. You may be seated. On Friday, or actually on Thursday afternoon, my wife, accompanied by her faithful companion Toby, which is our Shih Tzu dog, made a uh, trip back to North Carolina to see um, how things are going. We got reports, and the hardest thing for us is, you know, for my wife is being 1,500 miles away, and in phone conversations, you don't always get the picture of how things are going. And so uh, she decided to, to go because, you know, her dad's cancer has gotten worse, and uh, so um, she's planning to stay through the 31st and seeing how things go, and, and uh, we'll see if, uh, if she comes back, hopefully soon. Um, and uh, we're just praying for God's timing and God's will to be accomplished for her dad and mom and for Pam uh, during this time. She said she has lots of yard work to do, so she's going to stay busy. So we appreciate your prayers for us in that. Well, as we look at the text this morning, after the Denver Broncos won the Super Bowl, the players and team officials did their obligatory interviews with the media. And uh, they asked questions, but one of the things that I, uh, statement that I heard uh, clearly communicated from the Broncos and their, their team and their, their uh, coaches in the inter interview was the strong appreciation that they had for the dedicated fans that support them uh, as, as a team. And you know the Denver Broncos have some of the most uh, dedicated fans uh, in all of football. The Orange Crush back in many years ago when Denver first got a football team, uh, that, that sort of legacy has, has continued on. And you know there's a special relationship that develops between a, a team and its fans, its supporters. 
And that's especially true when they're winning, you know. It kind of is always tested maybe when they're not. But um, so we've seen that. And the 53 players that suit up for every football game is very small, a very small number in comparison with the large number of fans that they have, right? I mean, the guys that actually play the game are quite limited compared to the people who support them and root them on and wear their jerseys and, and have their homes decorated with purple, and, or I mean, I'm sorry, with, uh, <laughs> you got that one, didn't you, Dennis? Yeah. With that orange color, yeah. I didn't, have, I didn't like that orange and blue stuff. Anyway. Oh, man. It just comes through. I don't know. It just comes through. That purple. Anyway. So every, every fan, every, every team has that kind of, kind of association and partnership with a lot of people. You know, I'm sure as the players walk around in society, you know, and people recognize them. It's like, you know, they get a lot of, a lot of high fives, a lot of support, a lot of encouragement. And um, throughout the course of history, the actual num percentage of people that have been called by God into the full-time Christian ministry of the gospel is relatively small in comparison to the number of Christians. You probably could agree with that, right? The number of people that stand up and preach the good news as pastors, uh, apostles, teachers, evangelists, is quite limited to the, to the number of people um, that are a part of the body of Christ. And yet we see through the life of the Apostle Paul the vital need for a partnership to develop between those who are called by God to proclaim the gospel as a life calling and the individual members of the body of Christ, right? There needs to be a vital partnership between me and you. Every believer, according to Scripture, because of your faith, because of what Christ has done for you, you are a minister. You're a ministering servant with a ministry. And that's some of the things we're going to be investigating in the in. In, once we finish Second Thessalonians, because I, I think sometimes we've not really understood what that means. Salvation from sin is a calling to a new life where I get the privilege and I'm resourced with the Holy Spirit and spiritual giftedness from the Spirit to be engaged as a minister of the gospel. May not, may not be a professional calling, but it is a volitional, it's a calling of God to your life, and He's gifted you for service in the ministry of the kingdom so that more people can discover that Jesus saves, that Jesus gives life. I liken it to, you know, um, you, you folks, I call you this, hopefully you are the satisfied customers, Right? When a, when a pastor walks out in the street, you know, people know what you do, and they're, they're, they're expecting potentially that, that you're going to maybe uh, bring some spiritual stuff to them, right? Um, but what, what really, I think, resonates with people is when, when, when you go out to your business, to your job, to your work, and you face the same challenges and the same kind of struggles, and you face loved ones with hurts and pains and diseases and things like this, and you have a hope about you, you have a confidence about you, you have, you have, a, you have a strength in you, and it shows in your language, it shows in your, your, your countenance, your demeanor, your attitude, that you are living uh, a resurrected life with hope in Jesus Christ. That has the power for people to take notice. And to say, wow, what, what is it about you? What is it that's going on in your life? And you're the satisfied customer. 
as, we, as the psalmist says, uh, I've tasted and I've seen that the Lord is good. And, and we want to express that goodness to others. So, so we have this vital partnership that, that exists. And um, Paul saw this need to develop that partnership uh, between those who are called by God to, to preach the gospel and with ministers in the church. So uh, we see Paul very active in ministry in the letters that he wrote, uh, seeking to work with Christians in partnership with ministry. And you see some of the people that emerged from that. You see about the person by the name of Timothy and Titus, and you, you hear the, the person named Epaphroditus, and some of these other uh, workers like Barnabas and Silas and others that ministered. So we see a vital partnership that needs to exist between the pastor and the people. The missionary and the sending church is stressed in the gospel. So this morning as we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we notice in this third chapter as Paul begins to kind of wind up the letter, he enlists believers. He he calls believers to a partnership with him. Right? He wants them to be partners with him through a very important means of partnering with them, even though he is apart from them and he can't get back to them, which he wants to do. He's trying to communicate that they can still have a vital partnership of sharing life together, and that happens through the means of one thing that we call prayer. Prayer. He wants to enlist people in praying for him. He, he knows the things that he's called to do, he cannot do in his own strength. He knows he needs people interceding for him before the Father, upholding him in prayer. So one of the most significant ways members of the body of Christ can share or become partners in a ministry, in the ministry of the gospel, is through your commitment to pray for those who God th- through for those who God has called into service. Um, for when the victories come, when we're given reports uh, or see directly for ourselves the Holy Spirit of God working in the life of someone, and that we prayed for that to happen, we share in the joy, the encouragement that comes. Because that's what we petitioned God for. We prayed that He would move, that He would work, that, that, that His Spirit would, would open someone's heart to the, God's love and grace to them in Jesus Christ. And we see, when we see God moving directly in answer to our prayers, it's, it's very encouraging. It's very uplifting. And I know firsthand the powerful spiritual progress that happens in the lives of people through this partnership in prayer. Now, a lot of times we can come to church and think, you know, there's not a lot of things I really feel skilled at that I could really offer to this place, this body, to make it somewhat better, right? Um, We tend to diminish sometimes our abilities and, and our potential, But one of the things that every one of us can do, whether we have energy or not, whether we have our full, you know, physical strength and uh, mobility and whatever else, is we can pray. That's something every person can do. And certainly that's something uh, we are encouraged uh, to do by the passage. Notice in verse 1, Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. I mean, in this one small phrase, Paul is stressing some important things. Pray for us. First thing he's emphasizing is Paul stresses that he believes in the power of prayer, right? He says it. He wouldn't ask him to pray if he didn't think prayer would accomplish anything. He says, pray for us. He believes in this power of prayer. Three times in two letters that he wrote to this church, 
he asked them, pray for me. We read it in the book of Ephesians as he wrote to that church at Ephesus, pray for us, pray for me. He, put, he believes God moves in response to the petitions of his people for him, right? And we know Paul himself prayed in groups. You see that in Acts chapter 12. He fasted and prayed personally. He prayed and sang songs when he was incarcerated in prison, right? He prayed to God. He, he sang songs of praise. He knelt and prayed on the seashore to give thanks for his protection on his journey. It's kind of cool. I was, I was eating at Subway this week. I never eat there too much. I mean, I eat there a lot. Anyway, um, and right across from me, I, I noticed something quite interesting that I don't see very often. A woman sat down in her chair, and she actually paused before, you know, downing her lunch to pray. That's going, wow, you don't see that very often. Somebody who are outwardly, not, not bringing necessarily attention, but just as, as a way of life, a way of manner, this is like, I acknowledge God as the giver of this food. And I stop and I pray. And I'm not worried when I'm praying somebody's going to steal my sandwich. And you think, how often do we do that? Stop and pray. Maybe someone we're talking to us is talking to us, right, about some problems they're dealing with in life. Maybe someone at your work, someone at school. They, they've gone, they've, they've experienced something difficult, a tragedy in their life, in their family. And how often after they've shared that do we say, can I pray for you right now? And how much encouragement that brings to people when they know you're not a pastor. You're not some professional clergy person that went to school to learn how to pray. That any Christian at any time in any place can, can bring uh, one of those, uh, like some of our other uh, church bodies, one of those spontaneous prayers that come out of your relationship that's personal with God where you can cry out to him, your Abba, Father, and you know he hears you. Paul believed in prayer. He prayed in many different situations. And I hope in the time that you've been a Christian, God has made you aware of the powerful demonstrations of his power and that you've become a believer in the importance of your partnership with this ministry in prayer. We need prayer for next Sunday, next Friday. You know, those are the days when people come to church. Two days out of the year, people will, will think about, maybe I should do something religious, right? Right? We need prayer for Sunday that, that God will really do something mighty in the lives of people who come. We need to pray for Zootown Church, expecting 5,000 people to pack the Fieldhouse Adams Center at University of Montana. Things are, things are going quite well, but you never know. Uh, Scotty told me this week, Krispy Kreme Donuts donated 1,500 donuts to their service. So don't only you think about going out there, okay? <laughs> but can you imagine, you know, donating? They didn't ask for money for this. They want to be a part of this. That's pretty cool, I think. And so pray that all over the world, as people go to church on this day, people will get saved. People will find that God will open their hearts to the reality that Jesus is alive. 
And he's a, he's, a, he's a living Savior. He's conquered all of these enemies that we have in life. So Paul prayed because he believed in it. He stresses the importance, secondly, of the body participating in prayer. Right? Paul needed their help, right? He's calling out for their help. He, he's saying, I need your assistance. Pray for us. And the word prayer here, the way it's structured in the Greek language as a verb, is present active imperative. What that simply means is Paul saying he's commanding it. Keep on continuously praying for us. He's commanding them. He's not saying, well, you know, if you, if you think about it, it might be, might be a good idea. You know, if you just didn't have anything else going on, maybe, maybe it'd be all right if you prayed for me. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't beat around the bush. He says, pray for us. We need your prayers. We need your, your coming before the Heavenly Father. So he's demanding that they pray for him. He needs their partnership because of the intensity of the situations that he is facing and continues to face as an ambassador. Paul has faced a lot of difficult situations, a lot of persecution, a lot of people that just stood up and, and violently rejected him. And, and he needs prayer. He needs to know that people are supporting in him because he's a target. Look at verse 2. He tells them that wicked and evil men stand in opposition to me. And he believes in the power of the saints interceding for him that will provide him the strength that he needs to overcome and to minister in the presence of opposition, seeing people transformed for eternity. He's confident of that. And since distance has separated them, which it often does at times in life, he and their physical support um, can't be with them, with him right now. He's saying the next best thing you can do is pray for me. So how can our lives continue to benefit the Thessalonians, how can, our, how can we help Paul even though he's not with us? He says, you can pray for me. It's the greatest thing you can do to help me is pray for me. And I, I, I echo the same thing. You know, um, for about 55 and a half years of my life, I had one very committed person praying for me every Sunday. Was that, was, that was my mom. The hardest thing of letting her go to heaven, knowing that she's going to be in an awesome, she's in an awesome place and enjoying it, is, is I'm going to miss that lady praying for me. It was the greatest joy of going through some of the hardest moments of my life every Sunday morning. The strength I got to stand up in some very difficult situation was the fact that a few hours before I was sitting in a in a room praying with my mom. So we need we need support. We need prayers. It it's certainly a part of you, how you can help us in great ways of bringing your re the request before God. And Paul begins to also share with them and with us this morning how you can pray for us. How you can specifically pray for us. You know, things we need you to pray for us. Look at verses 1 and 2. He outlines to the Thessalonians how, how he wants them to pray for them. And notice, he doesn't, he doesn't pray for his physical strength. He doesn't, he, his requests are not selfish in nature. Notice he, he prays for the ministry that goes through his life, through God's Spirit working in him. Uh, he says they are to focus, the, the prayer requests are focused on God's work and the effective spreading of the good news through his life. The good news of Jesus to many people. So the first request uh, it, that's ministry related is pray. Pray for the rapid and widespread progression of the word of God to the hearts and lives of people. Pray that God's word will, will make a, have an impact in somebody's life. That's, that's what Paul's praying for. That's what he's asking people to pray for. I mean, he says 
Pray that the, the word of the Lord may speed ahead. It won't encounter, you know, the, the opposition that slow it down, that, that, that get it mired in the mud of controversy and, and, and discord and, and all kinds of frustration. Pray that it will speed ahead. It will, it will go with great power and effect. You know, Christianity was in its infancy when, when Paul was obviously the, the gospel minister to the Gentile nations. And, and Paul wanted this teaching of the word of the Lord to run rapidly, to speedily increase in its distribution to people. He wanted the truth of salvation to reach the hearts of the lost and dying people in a very expedient manner. You see, people living without truth find themselves in a very desperate situation in life. I'm sure Paul knew and witnessed people who died. Knowing they didn't know Jesus Christ. Knowing they didn't have a personal faith in Christ. He saw the grief of the families at the, at the grave, the wailing in the morning of people who wailed who did not have hope. And he knew the plight of people. That's why, you know, this week it came to me. You know, the, the message of hell and judgment is given to Christians to inspire us, to motivate us to share the good news of God's grace and love to them in Jesus Christ. But so often the church has taken the message of hell and judgment and slammed it at people living in sin. And you know what they do? They don't like it. They walk away from it. It's not the message necessarily that they need to hear. I think it's a message we need to hear to inspire us to go out and share the gospel. That Jesus loves people. He died for people. He bore their sins in his body on the tree. That they need to come to faith in him. I think people know about hell. And, and, and maybe someone, I'm not saying they can't benefit from knowing that, but so often people are written off in life because of confusion, because of sins gripping their life. People are willing to write them off and you're going to hell. But I look at the thief on the cross in the 11th hour. This guy is the worst of society. He is, he is worthy of, a, of being a public spectacle. He's thrown on a cross. He's, he's, he's going to be brutally sort of put to death because he is a, a menace to society. He is not a good guy, right? The thief on the cross. He's lived his life. He's the guy that the Pharisees would have said, you're going to hell with great excitement and, and enthusiasm and smugness, right? And in the 11th hour, just moments before his death, seeing the Savior, Jesus never said to him from the cross, hey, buddy, look, you're going to hell. He never said that. All the thief on the cross heard his father forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He heard the grace and the compassion and the mercy of Jesus Christ taking care of his mother. He heard it. It is finished. The battle's over. The, the debt's been paid. I've done my work. He saw all that and heard that and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you know what Jesus said? Today you'll be with me in paradise. You know what that says? Don't give up on anybody. Yeah, you may be around some very rough, surly characters that seem very vile and very opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have very much a hardened heart. Don't give up on them. The thief on the cross is a reminder to us that as long as this heart is still beating and ticking, some pe people have an opportunity to hear that Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. And 
And that message that Jesus saves needs to get out quickly and rapidly and fastly to as many people as we can. And we know not everybody's going to respond to that message. But the responses aren't our responsibility. They're God's. He just says, deliver the message. Send out the good tidings. Tell people of God's grace and love for them in Jesus Christ. Tell them that a Savior died for them. And a Savior wants to, wants to empower and help you conquer your greatest enemy, your greatest fear, which is hell and death. And some people may not be ready for that message, but you may face find someone who is. It's that person who's down and out. It's that person who's lonely. It's that person who's gone through a crisis. It's that person, maybe a family member, committed suicide. And there's no shortage of that today, is there? It may be that person who... Uh, who is facing uh, uh, an illness in life or a loved one that's facing a, a serious and critical uh, illness that, that the doctors haven't given them any hope and they need someone to come alongside them and say there is hope for everyone in Jesus. Paul wants the word of God to increase in its exposure to people. And I think that's a good message. That's a good prayer request today. You know why? Because... The Word of God is so maligned in so many places today. There's some days pastors wish in, pray, wish in their prayers that the Word of God would just spread to their own people. Because so often people are so fascinated by what the world has to say about everything. We can tell you what's happening in the world. We can tell you what's happening in the political campaign. We can tell you what's happening in the sports page. We can tell you what's happening in Hollywood. We know those things. We read those things. Those are, those are things that we look at. But th does the word spread rapidly to our own lives? Do we, even, do we even know what it says? Do we even know the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? Maybe we need to include that prayer that the word would spread rapidly to us and that from us it would go rapidly to the world. Why? Because there's an urgency in the getting the good news out. Because people are dying. And when people die without Jesus Christ, they spend eternity without Jesus Christ. And the only people that have the good news are those who are saved to tell them that Jesus is their Savior. Pray that the Word gets out rapidly. Secondly, pray that the Word of God the word of the Lord produces results to the glory of God. That's all we want. That's all I could ever ask you to pray for, for my life. Pray that the word of God will bring, it, the word will produce glory to God. Not to Discovery Church. Not to John Cook. I don't want glory. I want God to have the glory. I want Jesus Christ to be praised. Notice verse 1. He asked them to pray that the word of the Lord would be honored. It would be honored, right? The word of the Lord is honored in two specific ways. It is honored when people hear it and respect it and esteem it and value it, right? When it's lifted up, when it's accepted with love, it's greatly prized, it's honored. As believers take hold of the truth it teaches and apply it in their lives. That's how God's word is honored. When you hear the truth, when it comes to your life, and you go home and say, I'm going to do that. That's how it's honored. Just like those who came to Sunday school this morning heard about generous giving. God's word will be honored in your life when you sit down and purpose in your heart to be a generous giver. That's how the word of the Lord is honored. It's honored when believers allow it to shape and influence their life, their thinking, their, their, their motivations, their, their outlook, their future, everything else. It's honored when we become like Jesus Christ, when Christ's likeness begins to make itself known in our life. The Word of God is honored when we listen, when we learn, when we take seriously the truths that are, communi that are communicated to us. It's honored when it produces lasting change. God's word is honored when it produces lasting change through a life that is lived for the glory of God. 
when I begin to live for the glory of God, when that's my highest aspiration. I'm not living for a bigger paycheck. I'm not living for a bigger house. I'm not living for a, for a bigger uh, toys or more of this. I'm living, my, my, my ambition is to live for the glory of God. That's my own, that's my highest desire. God's word is honored when, when we embrace living for the glory of God. So pray, pray that God's word will be honored and revered in, in such a way that people will live for the glory of God. Is the word being honored in your life, in my life? Because it speaks to me in my daily quiet time, in my devotional life. The Word speaks to me. When I come to a Bible, say, the Word speaks because my heart's open. I want to receive it. And God's Word is being honored because there's more obedience. There's more compliance. There's more um, a desire in my heart to be in line with what God wants for my life. We need to pray. I ask you to pray that when I present God's Word, it will be honored through the change of life that takes place in all of us. Secondly, Paul, honor to the word of God uh, comes when people um, come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, right? When people uh, cross over from death to life. That's how God's word is honored, when salvation comes, when people feel convicted. They see the need to repent and turn in faith to Jesus Christ to be saved. What joy comes. I don't know about you, but I get really excited when I see people getting saved. Don't you? I love when, when you see someone, the light comes on and, and the joy that comes when they know, wow, my sins are forgiven. That's a good thing. When someone comes to the grips that I'm not living with a fear of death anymore because I, I have a Savior. He's risen. He's promised me eternal and everlasting life. When, when that when that light comes on in a person's life, that's exciting. That's what we pray for. From time to time, we've had those prayers answered, seen in someone come to faith in Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things, we, we did strategic planning yesterday, right? And we had about 20 people here, and it was great, good discussion. One of the things that came out of that, you know what came out of that? We need to be more a praying church. We've got to be more of a praying church. We need to schedule times for people to come and pray more, pray together, pray about things, pray about the concerns, to have prayer request cards in your bulletins that you can put in every week and you know someone's going to be praying for you. We need to do more of that. We're going to organize that. We're going to get that going. Lunch hour, bring your bag lunch. We've got an easy, cool place to sit and eat your lunch, right? Bring it, pray with some people. Imagine what would happen. You see, good works, salvation works, do not happen in the power of the flesh. They don't happen because the, uh, uh, a person has the ability to communicate certain facts to people. It happens only by the power of God's Spirit. That's why uh, one of the prophets said, It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And we need to pray that this work of the gospel here will always be done in the power of God's Spirit and not in the power of man or not in the power of the flesh. Because when it's of God's Spirit, it is life transforming. Pray for that. Pray that God's Word will be honored in bringing salvation to people in Jesus Christ. And there's finally one request. Pray for the protection of the messengers, right? Verse 2, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Anyone, I'm going to tell you, and I, I'm seeing it more and more in my life, anyone who's willing to boldly present the word of the Lord in this day, in this age, and in every age will face opposition. Okay? Why? Because the word of the, God, word of the Lord speaks things that are countercultural. What does that mean? The culture's going this way. The world's going this way. The word speaks against that. It speaks to a different kind of living that's lived through faith in Jesus Christ. And so when you become countercultural, guess what? You're not liked. Because the culture, you've seen it, wants everybody to swim the same way. They want everyone to believe the same things. To accept the same message. 
And it's always just puzzled me how people in this world think they're just so nonconformist, right? I'm nonconformist. I'm going to get a tattoo, and then everybody gets tattoos. And then how are you nonconformist? You just conform to what everybody else is conforming to. And it's other things. Well, I'm going to be, not, I'm going to be, I'm going to be this rugged individual. You're just, you're just conforming to a world system that's going a certain direction. You want to be a non-conformist? You want to be unique in this world? Be a Christian. Be a Christian. Live for Jesus Christ. You find out how countercultural you are. How much you're going to swim against the stream of what people believe. And we don't do that in a brash sort of arrogant sort of a uh, way to tick people off. We're to speak the truth of love. We're to speak the truth in ways that are gentle and kind uh, to people so that they can see the power of Jesus Christ in us. So we need protection as we preach the word because we're, we're swimming upstream. We're, we're teaching things that are countercultural when we preach the word of God. You see, the truth is convicting. Disobedient, rebellious, and faithless people do not enjoy having their lives put under spiritual conviction. They don't. People don't like that. Many of the Jewish audience that Paul addressed were brought under conviction as they were confronted with the, the, the issue of sin. And God's Word does this, right? And so what did they do? They didn't like Paul's message, so what did they do? They thought, you can't get at God, right? Because God's a spirit. He's invisible. So what do you do? You, you try to silence his messenger. When you look at all the persecutions, the floggings, uh, they had rocks thrown at him and left for dead. I mean, Paul took some huge beatings for the gospel. He even said in Galatians chapter 6, I bear on my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He called Christians in 2 Timothy chapter 1, join with me in suffering for the gospel. Paul was aware of the intense opposition that he faced. Wicked and evil men can refer to false teachers, immoral reprobates of society who who would see the gospel as a great threat to their way of life. And sadly, the opposition can come from people claiming to be Christian, but who are living in a worldly state of spiritual lukewarmness. And you know what Jesus said about spiritual lukewarmness? He said, I would rather you be hot or cold. I don't want you in the middle because if you're in the middle of spiritual lukewarmness, I want to spit you out of my mouth. It's detestable. So I believe and I'm convinced the power of this in any ministry to witness the transformation of people's lives come through a vital partnership that we have in prayer. You and I and we together praying for God to do his mighty work. And I have to say, I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, over the last number of years, the violence that is occurring around churches is growing. So much so, a lot of churches have full security. People obviously carrying weapons. Read a story about a pastor in Idaho a couple weeks ago. He walked out of his church and a guy was waiting for him and put six shots into him. There's opposition. There's people that don't want to hear this message. There's people that want to silence the messenger. That's why we need prayer. We need your prayers. Because not all have faith in God, right? There are some ministry tasks, again, that you may not feel qualified, but I, I believe we're all qualified to partner in prayer with your pastor 
for the gospel of the ministry in this, in this town and in the places where we come from. Because we're not just the Yankton Church. We're a regional church that reaches a lot of people from a lot of places. And our heart, my heart, goes to all the places where you live. I hope you never get the sense that I don't care about where you live, that somehow Yankton is the, the center of the universe, because I know it isn't, and you know it isn't. I care about wherever you live, wherever you God has placed you in life, and that's where the gospel goes, because it goes with you. We pray because we have faith in God. We pray because we believe He is able to deliver us from the, the wicked and evil people who don't have faith. And we pray, as Paul reminded Christians, we pray because we believe He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine according to His power that works within us. That's the message. Prayer is important. If it wasn't important, Paul wouldn't have asked them to pray. And he asked them, pray for us. Partner with us in prayer. Pray that the Word of God would speed on. It would go rapidly. It would reach great numbers of people all over the world. Just don't pray for Yankton. Pray for the world. Pray for missionaries in Muslim countries. Pray that the gospel will speed on. I'm looking at doing a series of messages very soon from put out by, uh, with, with great clips from the, from the voice of the martyrs of how people that are in Iraq and Iran and some of these Muslim nations, how they're standing firm for the gospel even though they're facing tremendous opposition. And what it calls us to do uh, as living as believers in our nation. I think you will be impressed. I think you will be overwhelmed. I hopefully, hopefully it will be something that will resonate uh, a powerful sort of life in us to, to see a bigger picture than just our little world. And that we can pray globally that the Word of God would press on with great rapid, rapid uh, exposure to many people. And that the, the word of the Lord would be honored and that the messengers would be protected. They will accomplish God's work as long as God wants them in the ministry. Father, I know in this audience this morning there are, there are my brothers and sisters who carry some heavy loads of loved ones who are, who are unbelievers, who are confused, who are struggling in life and, and are very aware, of well, very well aware of, of the eternal destinies. And I, I pray for them. I pray that you would encourage them, that it's never too late to pray and I pray that they won't grow weary in praying for their loved ones to come to faith, that somehow the walls would be broken down and that the good news of the word of the Lord could spread to them so that their hearts could be changed and that they could claim through faith salvation in Jesus Christ. Because I know that's a burden many people in this auditorium carry for loved ones that don't know Jesus Christ. And I pray somehow today, Lord, that you'll encourage them. And Father, I, I pray that the ministry of the good news of Jesus would go forth from, from all of us this week. And that we'll pray for the opportunities that you'll connect us with people who need to know the hope of Jesus Christ. Wherever that is. Maybe a conversation that starts. Maybe someone opens up to us that's never opened up about those kinds of things before. And we can share with people the hope that's within us especially in this wonderful week where we're looking forward to the celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Father, I pray that the good word of God, that, this, that your word would be honored, Lord, in our lives as we grow. I pray that we would take seriously what you teach us and that your word would be honored through obedience, through compliance, through peop people who are, who are being transformed daily into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh God, that that would have a powerful, powerful impact. And I pray for the protection of, of the ministers of the gospel who serve and who pray and who prepare to preach your truth to others. I pray 
uh, Lord, that you'll just give us the strength that we need for these days. Empower us, encourage us, lead us. We just thank you, O oh God, that you are mighty to save. And as we sing this song, um, pray that it will sound, resound with a greater fervency and meaning because you have saved us. You are mighty to save, and we believe that you're mighty to save many around us for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.